Stephen Moffat once described the Eleventh Doctor as a big kid pretending to be the great hero, and I think that sums up the Eleventh Doctor a lot. The Eleventh Doctor, on the surface, really is just this kid who wants to go around traveling, having a lot of fun, and he doesn't really like things to get dark and depressing. He he likes to ramble on a bit. He likes to he likes bunk beds over regular beds. He likes Saturday mornings and amazing things. And I think at the end of the day, it really helps when you realize that this is the last incarnation of the Doctor. The level of the Doctor's era really is enhanced by the knowledge that he's the last incarnation. When you look at this Doctor, you kind of would find it hard to believe this was the ninth Doctor. This was the tenth Doctor. You know, just because of how different he is and his approach. Well, you know, the tenth Doctor is very cool. The ninth Doctor is very intense. This guy can barely walk. You know, he can barely walk a couple of feet without falling over. He's goofy. He's awkward. He is the definition of not cool. And that's oddly what makes him cool. One of the things I like about the Doctor is when he's portrayed as someone who's totally easy to ignore. As if, you know, this this guy, he's nothing. He's a fool, whatever. And then he goes around and he destroys your entire life. And not the way when, you know, the Tenth Doctor whispered, doesn't she look tired? No, in the way that he's tricked you into blowing up your planet. He's tricked you into ordering your own genocide. You know, that sort of idea. Love that. Love that. That helped me figure out exactly what I like in the Doctor. At the same time, though, this Doctor also reminds me a bit of Merlin. Like, from the Sword to Stone Merlin, you know, like, insanely powerful, really doesn't do anything with it, and is a bit of a bubbler. Really fun, really intense, but there's also that amount of darkness to it. There's that certain darkness that, when, like, when the Eleventh Doctor said, good men don't need rules, he's really letting you know that he has all these rules. And I have these rules not because I'm a good person, but because I know what'll happen if I don't have those rules. All right, and you won't like it, I won't like it, the universe won't like it, just letting you know I have rules for a reason. At the same time, though, this doctor was also very good at showing how tired he was, how old he was. We saw this moment when he's talking with, Stor with um, Storm again in closing time, when he's facing his own mortality in um, The Wedding of River Song, and again... And things like um, the Time War. Moments like the Time War, which I think really do help shape this character's age. And this is helped especially by Matt Smith, who was very good at using his face. And even his walk. Like, one of my favorite moments of The Wedding of River Song is just watching him walk towards the impossible astronaut. Really, really great moment. At the same time, the 11th Doctor's era should not just be about him. Um, Amy and Rory were two really great companions. Although I would say Amy is the stronger of the two, primarily because Amy has Amy has the Doctor to play off a bit more than Rory does. Rory's entire character, again, is sort of tied very much to Amy, and that works when the writing's good for it. And their relationship, I think, is really great once it really starts going. Like, once Amy and Rory are together, the relationship is super great, and the idea of you know, Rory being erased from Amy's memory created some really great intimate moments, really great sad moments that were also helped with Vincent and the Doctor. One thing the Eleventh Doctor's era really helped shape to me was the idea that from the Time War on, the Doctor had been regenerating into someone younger, and it was still him dealing with the Time War. The Eleventh Doctor's era, I think, sort of closes off the bulk of the Time War, at least for the Doctor. I mean, we get to the 12th Doctor, he talks about, you know, when he closes his eyes, he has more screams that no one can ever be able to count. I don't think that's him not having dealt with the Time War, just sort of the fact that that's something he has to live with. Where with the 11th Doctor, he's very much trying to be, as the moment called him, the man who forgets. He's very set on trying to push that out of his mind. And that's sort of the really great part about name, night, day, and time of the Doctor, it's closing off the Time War for him, or at least the Time War in its biggest parts. Another fun thing about the Eleventh Doctor's era was the sense that the Doctor was finally realizing the hype. Like, the hype of the Doctor, exactly what he has made happen, whether intentionally or unintentionally, when it concerns him. He's no longer just a simple old man in a box that was found in a junkyard. He's now someone who can end wars with just a look you know, on some planets, the word 
doctor translates to warrior, not, you know, medicine man, learned individual. No, it means something entirely different, and as a result of it, uh, a group has stolen his best friend's baby to turn as a weapon against him. Granted, also because of the cracks in the cracks in time, but whatever. At the time, that was what we thought was happening. We also have the introduction of River Song, and River, lover or hater, River seems to be split down the middle when it comes to her supporters and detractors. I like River when River has a purpose, uh, which is usually most of the time she shows up nine times out of ten. Um, I enjoyed her when the Pandora opens. Um, the Angel storyline, whatever the mystery of River was still strong. I really enjoyed it. I think that is a problem that we that needs to be fixed in later episodes and stories. The uh, seasons five, six, and seven were not all inherently good. Season five, I think, is objectively the best season going by its popularity. But by the time we got to season six and season seven, it really did feel like we were putting more emphasis on the mystery than anything else. And there were a lot of great single episode stories, like single great moments of that era, but the overarching story just felt to drag stuff on a bit more. The mystery of Clara really, it made sense to an extent, but that was kind of it. Gallifrey didn't really return. The weirdness of fixing the, the, quest, the question that has to be answered, the the mystery of the impossible astronaut, the cracks in the universe, these are all things I've never really truly figured out until the actual end of the 11th Doctor's run. But at the end of it all, there was always this really big kid going around who didn't really want to let you know that he was so much more than that. He didn't like being alone, but at times I think he felt he was better off alone. We saw that when he had to erase himself from most of the recorded databanks of the universe. And, you know, he decided to let Amy and Roy think he was dead, and he secretly missed them a lot. We saw that again with the with um, closing time when he sees Amy and Rory at the mall, and he really wants to talk to them, but he knows he can't or shouldn't. I think the moments that really sum up the Eleventh Doctor, people like to go to his rage moments, but. As good as those are, I think what really sums up the Eleventh Doctor is the moment in the Eleventh Hour when he's just sitting across from Amelia Pond. He's eating fish fingers and custard. She's eating ice cream. Or whenever he's talking to the kid, like when he talks to that little boy in The Almost People, that was a great moment for the Eleventh Doctor. So the idea that he's really, really this cool grandfather figure, that was a really great aspect of his character in Time of the Doctor. He's just an old man in a tower telling stories, fixing toys. And I, th I think that's who the Doctor really wants to be at the end of it all. At the end of the day, he just wants to sit around, fix some toys, and tell some stories. But, you know, he's a wandering man. He's a, wander he's a wandering man also. He, all the time and space calls to him. And this Doctor also sort of explained to us why the 11th Doctor, or why the Doctor wants companions. You know, not just because it's lonely, but because... It's more fun to see something he's already seen with somebody else. He talks about how, you know, I, I've seen, I can look at a star. I know where it begins. I know where it ends and everything. You, you have it. You still have the spark. You still have the interest. This is much more positive than in, say, Shirt So, where the Eighth Doctor said, we travel with you humans to remind us of death because you're going to die. Yeah. Granted, that was a great moment too, but this one felt a bit more personal, a bit more um, integral to the Doctor. Than the Eighth Doctor, which felt more in line with what Time Lords would do. So, yeah, that's the Eleventh Doctor. I think he's best when he's allowed to play that tired old man who would really rather just, you know, fly a helicopter and then jaunt off to do some wild thing in space and then come right back and do some more stuff with the kids. Or at least that's how I've always interpreted it. Now, let's talk about the best and worst of the Eleventh Doctor, at least from my perspective. From worst, let's talk about the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe. So this episode is just sort of dull. Like, I like the premise, the Doctor pretty much spending time with his family who's lost someone close to them, or, is a, or rather the mother has, and she's waiting to tell her children that. And the Doctor's like, well, no, no, before that, let's give them the best Christmas ever, because they're going to be sad afterwards. That, to me, made a lot of sense. Like, this is going to end up being one of the worst days of life, so let's build it up. Let's... Let's make it as happy as possible because tomorrow they're going to be super sad. 
And that was fine. You know, the snowmen played off of that one a bit better. But for the most part, this was just kind of forgettable and a bit pointless. The middle is really pointless. Next up is Night Terrors. So Night Terrors may secretly be good. I'm not entirely sure. It's not as bad as Sleep No More. Sleep No More puts me to sleep, which is, again, really weird and contradictory. But with Sleep No More, it just so well, – with Night Terrors, it's like this wants to tell an interesting story, but I'm just not getting it. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, and the kid's an alien. Sweet. Um, Curse of the Black Spot isn't – is like Night Terrors, probably not that bad, but – I don't know. I don't know. It's it's an Amy and Rory story, and I don't feel they actually need a story so much as we'd like to think. It's more of an Amy story than a Rory story, but whatever, whatever. Um, Crimson Horror. This was still part of the Who is Clara Oswald arc that never really had any progress to it for the most part. It's usually just the doctor looking at a screen all the time. It's like, who are you, Clara Oswald? Oh, here's Clara. Let's go somewhere, Clara. Like, the best thing about this episode for me was... I guess Jenny fighting. Strax is humor because it wasn't beating us over the head with it. And the fact that that's the Queen of Thorns who's got the little parasite. And when the doctor goes, you know what that, what that can do with the wrong hands? She goes, do you know what these are? The wrong hands! Oh, and Hyde. Yeah. Hyde is just sort of dull. Like, I don't really get the point. Like, the setup was great. Like, when the trailer's with he goes, I'm the doctor and I'm afraid. I'm like, well, that's interesting. But we don't go anywhere with it. Now on to the best, my personal best, um, The Snowman. I love when the Doctor has stories where he has to come out of her time, he has to come out of his little dark hole. And for this one, it's the Doctor doesn't actually come out until the Bells of St. John, effectively. But this is where it begins, another mystery of Clara. It sets things up about the great intelligence, which is a nice little drop for classic Who fans. And I love when Doctor is set in Victorian London. It's just fun. Just interesting. Also, how the Doctor spends a lot of time trying not to get involved. Just sort of walking off like a grumpy old man. Um, Time of the Angels, uh, Flesh and Stone is next. I like this a bit more than Blink. Primarily because there's not enough of the Doctor in Blink. I, I don't really like Doctor Light stories. I don't hate them. But I'd much rather have the Doctor be around just doing stuff. And this one is that... You know, Amy's there. The idea that the Weeping Angel can turn you into a Weeping Angel if you look at it too long is pretty brilliant. It's like you either let us take you or you become one of us. Pick one. Uh, next is The Doctor's Wife. So The Doctor's Wife, I didn't think I'd like it. Um, quick aside, I watched pretty much all the 11 of The Doctor's Era out of order because that's just how I got into Doctor Who. Uh, my original experience was just my only actual moment of seeing uh, Doctor Who was the last few minutes of the end of time where I watched David Tennant explode, and I had no idea what was going on. But the Doctor's wife really brought home the, the time war, at least to me. You know, the idea that the Doctor is so desperate to find other time lords, the idea that he can be forgiven by them for what he's done, and the fact that he still, wear, he still wears that guilt and the shame of what he had to do, even though he kind of distances himself from it, which is another great aspect of the Doctor's character. Because it creates its own little arc. The Impossible Astronaut Day of the Moon is next. So even though the Wedding of River song is more just fluff fun, like there's a lot there's a lot going on that just doesn't seem to really uh, click. At least for me, I know a lot of people like it. I know a lot of people do like it. But the Impossible Astronaut was that great setup. Uh, we've got the Doctor in America, Amy and Rory are there. Amy, Rory, and River have to deal with the fact. That, oh yeah, the Doctor just died right in front of us. And he apparently sent letters to all of us to watch it, and then he called himself to look it up. So they have this big mystery going on. And that was super interesting and fun. Also just watching the Eleventh Doctor just talk to the silence. And then watching how River kills all the silence. And that moment where River kills one of the silence without looking at it. And the fan theory is the reason she, she knew it was there was because she saw Rory, her dad, scared. And all she knew was whatever scares my dad has to die. I love it. Love it. The Pandorica opens and the Big Bang, the mystery of what happened to Rory, is brought forward here. And Amy Roy had this really great moment. What makes Amy Roy's relationship great is that it really relies on silence. Like, at the end of the day, Amy just wants to hug Rory. And it's really sweet and beautiful. She just wants to hold him and never let go. It's really, really nice. And then Rory shoots her. 
But then Rory resolves to be this eternal guard for Amy Walsh's and the Pandora. It's really, really sweet. Then we have that really epic speech for the Eleventh Doctor as he addresses every enemy that's ever tried to kill him. I think they were a bit short some people. I'll have to do a list at some point to figure it out. But then the Big Bang story, which was an interesting idea that, you know, the time is running out and we have to reset the universe. Really fun, really fun. Then we get to the Eleventh Hour. So the Eleventh Hour, as I said before, has this really great moment with just the Eleventh Doctor and Amy, or Amelia at this time, just eating snacks in the middle of the night. And the Doctor effectively becomes Amy's super imaginary best friend, which I think sums up how, the, how this Doctor is in a lot of ways. He's too, he's too bizarre to be real, but you really want to be real. This is going to take you all these fun adventures that may have never actually happened. Like the theory that the Eleventh Doctor, and possibly the Doctor as a whole, only exists in Amy's head, is a bit lazy, a bit disturbing, but fun nonetheless. And finally, name, night, day, and time of the Doctor. So, I've always had this theory, like I said before, that the Doctor regenerates into someone younger after the time will be because he's trying to distance himself from it. And this four part uh, these this four part story really does emphasize a lot of what's going on, a lot of the big elephant in the room for the doctor since the show came back, which was the time war. Name of the doctor shows us the war dog, the doctor who did it, who quote unquote broke the promise. Uh, Night of the doctor showed us how this doctor came into being. Day of the doctor is six, us seeing exactly what happened that day to an extent and the idea that we're trying to save Gallifrey while trying to wipe out the Daleks, which is always the weird part, because to me, it seems like no matter what we do, the Daleks will still be there. It's, it was like a really terrible sacrifice. The only thing that was actually gone was Gallifrey. And Time of the Doctor is the revelation about the Doctor's uh, regenerations, the idea that Gallifrey is out there somewhere, it's going to come back, and the whole new regeneration cycle. It sort of closes out not just the 11th Doctor, but the post-Time War Doctors. This is especially true when the 11th Doctor, who spent a lot of time trying to forget and distance himself from his past, is saying, I will not forget one day, what line of this, not one word. I will always remember what the Doctor was me. That's him embracing everything. The Time War, what happened to Rose, what happened to Donna, what happened to the Pawns. It's all something he's going to shoulder with him. He's going to keep going. And that's why he's so excited about getting into a generation cycle. The work continues, and... This time, he's going to remember everything. Or at least that's how I've always viewed it. And maybe I'm wrong about the 11th Doctor. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on your favorite, least favorite moments of the 11th Doctor's era. I'll leave that down in the comment section. If you're new to the Bucket Think Tank, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Always be willing to share. And I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Think Tank signing out. May your fandom serve you well.